Why do residents of Fort Myers Island's beaches and neighborhoods love their homes so much? Perhaps it's experiencing a community so welcoming, they're happy to share what's cooking with whoever's hungry. Or that a day of bird watching in nature is so gratifying, it calls for a celebration with local craft beer. Or maybe it's the amazing colors of the sky as the sun sinks into the sea. Come discover all there is to love in Southwest Florida. Get inspired at visitfortmyers.com. A quick warning, there are curse words that are unbeeped in today's episode of the show. If you prefer a beeped version, you can find that at our website, thisamericanlife.org. Justina Tedesco knows exactly when she got the idea to leave suburban New Jersey and move to a different state. It was still at the height of COVID. Her second grader was doing remote learning. The vaccine had barely been introduced, and most people couldn't get it. She was working from home, and her son's class took a snack break. So we would usually go into the kitchen, grab a snack, Mm -hmm. and on the TV was, of course, Fox News. And DeSantis was on the the TV talking about the pandemic and how he disapproved of how other states were handling things. And he said, he goes, well, you know, since we're we're handling things so differently, if you're not happy in the state you live in, come to Florida. We welcome you here. If you look at home sales, I mean, it's pretty clear that people are viewing Florida as a landing pad. Uh, but when we looked look up the clip, DeSantis didn't exactly tell people to move to Florida, but uh, you can see how Justin took it that way. You know, Tucker, it's interesting. As this went on, I would encounter people, particularly in September, that would move from parts of the country, say, look, they closed our schools. Uh, I want your schools are open. I'm going to come here because you guys are doing it right. But I really do think these lockdowns have driven some people to Florida who just had enough with these draconian, ineffective restrictions. It was, it, I don't know, it was like music to our ears. And I thought about it for a second. And I'm like, could you imagine us like living in Florida? Could we do it? Like, could we just pick up everything and move? The big thing she wanted? In-person learning for her son. For Dennis and Alinda Michael in a small town in Washington State, there's a story on NBC News around the same time that did the job. The story was about a grocery store in Naples, Florida. And it was a hit piece on them because everybody was walking around the store without their mask on. In fact, the reporter in the story reads comments from people who saw video of this store online. Prompting mostly heavy criticism. I can't stop watching this. My jaw is literally on my desk. This should be a crime. People across the country are dying because of behavior like this. And from a woman mourning her father's death from COVID. And I thought, that's a place I want to be. Wait, wait, wait. I just want to be sure I understand. There was a story on television saying, look how terrible these people are. They're walking around without masks. And you saw that and you concluded... That's where I want to be. The the terrible people part I ignored because it, it looked to me like there were people that were enjoying life and it it just was a sense of freedom that we didn't have in Washington State. I was curious about all this because in the speeches that Ron DeSantis is giving as he runs for president, he talks a lot about how Florida is the fastest growing state, which it is. And he talks about how people are moving to Florida because of him and all he's done there. Which, you know, who knows? It's true that among the transplants, there are twice as many Republicans as Democrats. But I wondered, what is really happening? Was DeSantis actually the reason that people uprooted their lives and crossed the country? Like, they wanted to be part of his Florida experiment. So in the last week, I've talked to a half dozen people who told me, yes, they did exactly that. Though they all said it wasn't just politics. It was also the fact that there's no state income tax in Florida. And housing prices. For nearly all of them, that's way cheaper than where they moved from. They love the sunny, summery lifestyle. But they all said politics clinched it. In particular, COVID politics. The way Governor Ron DeSantis broke ranks early and loudly from other states in opening schools and ditching mask mandates. And that's when migration to the state picked up. As one woman, Kim, who moved from Payson, Utah, put it. We honestly had never even considered Florida prior to COVID. Wow. Um, Yeah, not been on our list at all. (laughs) Justina wanted to get her second grader on board with the idea of moving. And so before they put their house on the market, she sat down with them on the living room couch, and they each put a piece of paper on the coffee table, and each wrote out the pros and cons of going to Florida. And I said, okay, well, Vincent, let's let's sit down and let's write down all the things that come to your mind about what makes Florida awesome and then what we would might miss if we move away from New Jersey. 
And so he goes, okay. So my list started with, obviously, at the top of mine was was in-person learning. And then I had on my list, no state income tax. I wrote DeSantis down as one of the items. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He was literally just, his name was listed as number three. And some of my cons were, you know, missing our family, not having the convenience of being able to to have babysitters as frequently. She has a big Italian family living around them in New Jersey. And when I went to go review my son's list and I said, hey, what do you have? His list had, um, his pros were lizards, were on his pros list. And I think mm-hmm. I actually had that on my cons list. <laughs> and his, on his cons list, he wrote sharks. But the most important and, thing, uh, yeah, so he didn't write that he would miss his classmates or his school, which told Justina his remote learning experience was so bad, he wasn't bonding with those kids. And they really got to get out of New Jersey and into in-person school. While COVID policies were the thing that really convinced the people I talked to into moving, almost all of them like the other stuff that Ron DeSantis has so prominently brought to Florida. His anti-woke policies, restricting what's said in schools about sexuality and race and systemic racism. His ban on gender-affirming care for trans kids and on transgender girls doing sports with other girls. His ban on abortion after six weeks. Justina weighs up the trade-offs this way. I do miss all my family. And I, and I said to myself, too, you know, I'd rather be where I have most things in common with people and I can always visit New Jersey or New York, you know, on vacation. <laughs> but in our program, Ron DeSantis is running around the country telling Americans we can all have what these new Floridians are loving in their new homes if we vote for him for president. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker, Make America Florida. So what would that be like? How's it working out for people? Today we go inside the Florida experiment he's created there. From WBEZ Chicago, this is American Life. I'm Ira Glass. Stay with us. Tech one, prescription for freedom. So Ron DeSantis' governorship and also the presence of Donald Trump in the state have created a kind of hothouse of a political experiment on the right in Florida with all kinds of wealthy, influential right-wingers migrating to the state, specifically to Sarasota County, northwest of Mar-a-Lago, over on the Gulf Coast. Perfect example, Mike Flynn is one of the newest arrivals. He moved to Englewood in Sarasota County. You might remember Mike Flynn. President Trump appointed him as national security advisor, and he lasted only 23 days in that job. He got kicked out after getting in trouble for lying to the FBI about talking to the Russian ambassador. In Florida, he started a whole new life, waging a kind of information war and a political war on the far right. And Sarasota is the right place for a guy like that to live out his dreams. Steve Bannon, the co-founder of Moms for Liberty, the headquarters of Rumble, of Truth Social, I could go on, Charlie Kirk, Patrick Brin, Doug Logan, they all have ties to Sarasota County. Tucker Carlson is just down the coast. For whatever reason, Sarasota County which in the past was a wealthy white area for old-fashioned pro-business Republican types, has now become a place where these MAGA right-wing rich guys have set about building their ideal version of society. And at Flint's side, there's this one guy in particular who's been bounding from one project to the next, creating this little parallel universe down there that we're going to talk about in this next story. Because this guy's a pioneer in this movement that you're going to be hearing a lot about in this next election. Maybe you've already heard of it. Medical freedom. In Ron DeSantis' case for being president, Make America Florida, medical freedom is a big item. One of our producers, Zoe Chase, was very interested to understand its appeal and growing popularity and spent some time down in Sarasota County. The guy I'm here to talk about is named Vic Meller. He has a bunch of money, like suspended on politics. Just a few months ago, he paid $3 million for a building in Sarasota County, 959 East Venice Avenue. He's teaming up with Mike Flynn and some others to use it for this hybrid office down here. One side of it is a production house for the launch of Flynn's upcoming podcast. And then here's the studio where, you know, General Flynn's going to start his... This is really nice. Like most people with their their little shows, it's not like this. This is a big studio space. Well, well, I guess it's good that I have no experience in it then, huh? <laughs> so I come out swinging hard. <laughs> Wow. Well, what would you expect for General Flynn? I mean, you know, he's going to have top of the line. You know, I'm going to give him top mm-hmm. of the line everything. You know? Vic is a big guy. He ducks through doors. Uh, he's tall. He's uh, wide. Dresses like he just walked off a construction site. 
which he did. He runs a precast concrete business. He makes the huge blocks of hollowed-out concrete that make up buildings. He dreams big. Which brings me to the other half of 959 East Venice, the part I really want to tell you about. The place where Vic and his movement are inventing something new. Specifically, the other half of this building is going to be a medical clinic. We the People Health and Wellness Center. We the People, drawn in founding father's cursive on the big glass doors. A clinic that caters to people who did not get the COVID vaccine, who do not trust the medical establishment, and want a place to go where they can be treated by people who think like they do. Um, about 10,000 square foot. This will be the, the IV room. Vic shows me the exam rooms, the carved out area for pediatrics, the adult examination area, the soft gray IV drip room where you can sit quietly and get liquid vitamins pumped into your arms. The whole building is 10,000 square feet. This is roughly half. It opens in September. Two to three nurses, maybe a primary care doctor, one pediatrician for sure, at least to start. I wanted to take a look at this building of Vicks because it captures so much to me about this moment in American politics. This half ivermectin clinic, half Mike Flynn flagship podcast studio. It's symbolic of a new momentum on the right, where people took certain lessons from the pandemic. Mandates are bad. Vaccines are suspect. The scientific community is out to get you. The government telling you what to do in healthcare is dangerous. And they're building a movement from those principles. 959 East Venice is like an early fort on that frontier. A beachhead for this political movement that's coming into the mainstream called medical freedom. Also, I'm not going to say this is uniquely Florida, but it's pretty Florida-shaped what happened here. So let me get into Vic's story and the experience of some of these other people in Sarasota to explain how this building came to be. Vic is a new political convert, and he's newly flush. Vic is not one of the new arrivals in Sarasota County. He's in his early 50s now. He's been here 30 years. He started with nothing and built a successful concrete business. He was a big Fox News watcher with a recent history of bringing new things into the world that he thinks should exist. Like, before he built this clinic, a few years ago, feeling antsy and agitated about the state of the world with some money to burn, he decided to buy some land a few miles away from his place in Venice. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to open up a campground for kids. It's going to be based on the Constitution with an emphasis on the Second Amendment. So while the kids are out there, we're going to teach them gun safety, and then we're going to bring them out to the range, and they can be proficient, you know, shooting and such. And Teach kids how to shoot. Teach kids how to shoot, absolutely. But it's a day camp, too. You know, people just go out. I got water slides. I got all these other little adventure things they do. We got you know, this big lake with gators and fish and zip lines. And yeah, and we zip line right over the gators. It's yeah, yeah, absolutely. He calls it the hollow because it's a swampy, hollowy place. And after the hollow core concrete blocks he manufactures. When I was out there, it was like a lost boy paradise. These kind of wild gardens around bouncing hanging bridges that were stretching over the water between a few islands, grape trellises, flowers, bushes. Oh, there's a gator right there. Where? Ah! Holy what are you, you scared? That's like, it's like a six or seven footer. That's a baby. After he built the hollow, Vic met Mike Flynn, which changed his life. And these days, they talk or see each other every day. Vic helps Flynn get all his projects off the ground and helps fund some of them. I would call Mike Flynn a father figure in Vic's life. He doesn't disagree with that. He grew up without a dad in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. When General Flynn showed up in Sarasota, that's how Vic always refers to him, as General, it organized Vic's ambient angst about Trump witch hunts and the media, and his jones about the Second Amendment, into something much closer to Flynn's worldview, which amounts to a comprehensive one-world order conspiracy aimed at him and other Trump loyalists. So at that point, all the parents, everyone, like, freaked out. And they, they made all these groups, and were, everyone's meeting all over the place, just trying to organize and do whatever. And then, um, you know, someone just said, hey, how about we all just meet at the hollow, you know? And I was like, okay, bring them all down, let's do this. 
at this big meeting, Vic meets a very essential partner in this whole endeavor. The other person the story's about. One of the newly politicized moms of Sarasota County. Small but mighty Tanya Paris. Petite blonde, pink nail polish, with a bustling, just left the PTA meeting energy. She's got a five and a seven-year-old in school. I did not want my children to be in mass. They did not want it. My son was breaking out and all these disgusting things, and I have psoriasis. So I was like, oh my, start it. What if he's getting, he's got psoriasis and it's coming out? So I was getting really upset. So I was like, he's not. From the mask, you think? Like his skin was drying out somehow? Okay. And he was not being sanitary with it. He's, He's yeah, exactly. And then now I have a kindergartner coming in who definitely can't wear a mask, right? I mean, he was flicking them across the room, dropping them on the floor. I saw absolutely no purpose in him wearing it. Drop it on the bathroom floor and then put it on his face. I'm like, that's absolutely disgusting. How does So Vic sure and a bunch of parents, Tanya among them, decided to organize a big mask waiver signing out at the hollow, where doctors would give them notes so their kids wouldn't have to wear masks in school. Tanya's a former EMT. She was in a trailer they installed out there, taking vitals before they met with the doctors. We started it early in the morning, and cars just started coming in, just pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. And it's hot. It's freaking hot. And it's everyone's waiting outside. So I would poke my head out, and I'm like, holy crap. There was, I mean, there was so many people lined up I couldn't see the end of the line, and it wrapped all the way around. It was completely full of people. To be clear, the thing they're all fighting against, wearing masks in school. The science shows masks are effective at slowing the spread of COVID, if you wear them. This mask waiver event at the hollow was a turning point. Like, once Vic saw how many of them there were, he realized... But we could be doing a lot more here. This is a full-fledged political movement that I can throw myself into. Tanya, meanwhile, became this connector between these apostate doctors and patients who didn't want to go to regular hospitals. In late 2021 and into the next year, if you wanted a doctor who would see you without a mask or wouldn't push the vaccine, she could give you names. You know, people talk to each other. They say, hey, you know, Tanya hooked me up with another doctor, whomever. It's like a whole parallel medical system. It's like a totally underground medical system. Mm -hmm. And then I did a lot of the vetting for these doctors because they were so busy with patients and dealing with people who needed ivermectin and had COVID. Getting ivermectin became a huge focus of this emerging parallel medical system. A surprising amount of the emotion driving this movement has to do with ivermectin. You probably remember ivermectin, the horse drug. People started taking huge doses to cure themselves of COVID at one point. But the science says ivermectin doesn't work for COVID. It's an amazing drug for other things like parasites, not COVID. No matter, though, doctors on YouTube were promoting things like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine as miracle cures. Quick, cheap, easy solves for COVID. You may remember that YouTube and Twitter and Facebook removed videos because it wasn't true and it got put on that short list of designated official misinformation that the tech companies would actually do something about. But when those ivermectin-loving doctors got shut down, they only got more famous within the medical freedom movement and set up shop on alternative media platforms like Rumble and Telegram. They created a whole alternate ecosystem of podcasts and podcast networks. In a while, he's a, an amazing person who has been uh, persecuted by the COVID police like no one else. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Eric Naputi. How are you doing? Mercola, welcome to my podcast. Brigade surgeon while serving in the Army, Dr. Rashid Buttar. Today we're speaking yet again to an eminent expert. The basic the conspiracy theory articulated on a lot of these shows is this. COVID was a man-made, created virus masterminded by Bill Gates and the World Health Organization in order to control the world's population. Vaccines were pushed in order to kill us. Lockdowns were used in order to control us. Moderna, Pfizer, they're in on it. They want to kill off ivermectin because it's a cheap alternative to what they're selling. The conspiracy has a name. It's called The Great Reset. And that's what Flynn will be covering on his show, down the hall from the clinic, among other things. General Flynn, back to you, sir. Uh, What is this uh, vaccination campaign truly all about for anybody who may be hearing this for the first time? What we are facing is we are facing a globalist takeover 
of every freedom loving country in the world. And they're using this vaccination to control us. OK, like when I asked Vic and Tanya straight up if they believe in the Great Reset, they were both like, I'm not going to cop to that exact thing, like all the stuff you said, specifically like maybe it wasn't Bill Gates. But yes, there was a power grab and there was money to be made. And if you think about that, that doesn't mean that you're a conspiracy theorist. That just means that there's greedy people in the world, which we all know. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person because I believe our government is more corrupt than you do. This is a patriotic movement. It, it is. I, I'm going to say, fuck this globalist shit. You know, seriously, I, I, I'm, a, I'm totally against it. It makes sense to me that Tanya was the person who threw herself into this project of building this alternative medical system and now running the We the People Clinic at 959 East Venice. She's definitely a take matters into your own hands type. And she feels like doctors haven't listened to her in the past when she needed them. I basically have a 21-year-old son and I have a nine and a seven. Huh. So I had 13 miscarriages in between. Oh my God. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was awful. That was an awful time in my life. But, um, so yeah, it, that very, was, very hard. it was awful. So, obviously, did and I'm research, 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 research. That's all I do. That's what I do is I dig right. in. You wanted to, like, solve that, figure that out. I like to solve everything, try to at least have an understanding for myself. Mm-hmm. Nine miscarriages in, Tanya seemed to find a doctor who figured out something that might help. And then she had two kids, right in a row. The kids who years later would go on to flick masks onto the bathroom floor during COVID. I didn't like that it took me nine miscarriages before anyone cared to, to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. What we're chronicling here, remember, is the establishment of a headquarters of this new magified medical freedom movement at 959 East Venice Avenue. Half podcast studio, half medical clinic. And the next big moment in the story of the creation of this building happens at arguably the opposite of this place, the main hospital in the area, Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Not long after the mask mandate event at the Hollow, Vic started up a political organizing company to support what he calls freedom candidates, America First candidates, essentially Trumpists. He called it the Hollow 2A and threw a lot of money into it. They supported a slate of school board candidates who swept into office, They also backed another group of candidates for a local hospital. Sarasota Memorial Hospital is governed by a publicly elected board, and they supported four candidates who were aligned with this medical freedom movement. These candidates were basically anti-everything the hospital was doing, anti the CDC protocols they used, anti the vaccines they administered, upset that the hospital didn't offer ivermectin and other alternative medicines to patients who wanted it to treat COVID. They kind of wanted to tear the whole place down, and they called for a big investigation into everything that had transpired during COVID. Three of their preferred candidates won. Not enough to control the board, enough to make some noise. The public hospital has public meetings every month, and you can imagine how those have been going. So, let's begin our meeting. In February of this year, 2023, the board was delivering the results of a three-year review of the hospital's performance during the COVID pandemic. The report was glowing. The hospital's COVID-19 death rate was about 25 percent lower than state and national averages. Hospital stays were shorter, too, which is a pretty great verdict for a place full of elderly people. Vic and the Hollow crew didn't believe those results at all. They started pushing for a completely independent investigation of the hospital's COVID practices. Kind of like those forensic audits that people who thought the election was stolen wanted after 2020. Demands to comb through every ballot, every gear of the voting machines. But this, of course, was way more personal because there was all this grief and pain mixed in with the suspicion. When we had people getting up there crying and saying, all we want to do is I want answers. I want to sit down with the doc. I want to understand why my husband died, why you wouldn't let me come in there, why you wouldn't use ivermectin, why did you give her remdesivir when I told you not to give her remdesivir? All of these things were coming up. My son was 39 years of age when it ended up 
in the hospital. My son was 39 years of age when he went into the hospital, this one woman is saying up at the mic. We weren't allowed with him. He was alone. He was alone. We had a prescription of ivermectin. That was very hard to fill. We finally got it filled. We brought it in and they refused to. You know, and it's like, where is the team anymore? There's no team. It's like, doctors are making these decisions for all of us. It's like the doctors are making decisions for all of us. They said his organs are failing. He's 39. What do you mean his organs are failing? We asked. They said his organs are failing. He's 39. What do you mean his organs are failing? We asked for ivermectin. I had my lawyer on the phone. They refused. All the nurses and doctors, she goes on. I know how hard you work. But the CDC protocol, it's killing people. Dr. Manny Gordillo ran the COVID response at the hospital. He was at that hearing but didn't speak. Ivermectin came up in so much of the testimony that I wanted to talk to him about that. It was a stand-in for so many things, but it was also just a drug, a relatively harmless drug. Why not just give them the ivermectin? So so ivermectin is, to me, is just a symbol. It's a word. When they did properly done studies, they showed that it doesn't, it's no better than placebo. Large studies, they show no benefit of the thing. So... So then how are we going to be, you know, after after the properly done study showed that there's no benefit, how are we going to be telling people, oh, yeah, you know, this thing doesn't work, but I'm still going to give it to you. Uh, so we're not in medicine giving people placebo and stuff like that, especially when it distracts from giving the proper medications. That's what drives them nuts. When people who have been lied to refuse remdesivir, which can work, and want ivermectin, which does not you know, which just make no sense. So then then uh, it becomes a problem. This is the unbridgeable divide between the medical professionals and the medical freedom people in this case. To the activists, it's bad medicine to not give ivermectin. To the professionals, it's bad medicine to give it. There's not a middle ground to be had. Dr. Gordillo is an infectious disease specialist, and he's had many of these confrontations, conversations, with family members demanding alternative COVID treatments over the past few years. It was rough running the hospital's COVID response. He'd coped with death threats against his family, protests outside the ICU. He'd work 100 hours a week. It was hard on his marriage. His wife was like, these patients hate you, and you're still going to work for them? What kind of a person are you? I thought what happened at the meeting might make him mad. I mean, I was ups- uh, I was frustrated more than mad. Because mm-hmm. I, I, by the time I, I knew what the, the strategy of these people was, you know, I, I, I was mad at the at the at the people that did the manipulation. I was not mad at the patients. You know, the patients in the end they they are victims from the manipulators. Dr. Gordillo is from Peru, from a place he says the choices were becoming a fisherman or a priest. He tried something else, of course, but he still fishes. That's one of the things he loves about living in Sarasota. Something that surprised me, Dr. Gordillo did take a serious look at ivermectin. There were early studies showing it killed COVID in a test tube. Problem was the doses it took were much too high to give to a human being. He says when people know they're going to die... People always ask for alternative treatments to all kinds of things, for HIV, cancer. He's seen it a lot over 30 years. And his attitude is, if the treatment won't hurt you, sure, go get it elsewhere. If an alternative clinic gives out ivermectin, he's like, whatever, they're just not going to do it at his hospital. I I personally don't have a problem with that. You know, like if people in the end, they're going to decide on their own what they want to do. Um, All I can do is give him advice on what is the best treatment as I know it, as our our current state of science and the current state of knowledge uh, tells us, you know, um, and that's the way science goes. I let Tanya and Vic know Gordillo had taken a serious look at ivermectin. But when he did look at the studies that were done in America, 
with thousands of people, it showed that basically ivermectin was a placebo. It was like no better than a sugar pill. Can I answer this one? Sure. Okay, so I I would like to see this study that he's referring to. Okay. And I would like to see who did it. I'm sure it was cherry picked because they knew this was coming up anyways. His answer probably shouldn't surprise anyone who's been living in America lately. You have studies? I have studies too. You have doctors? I have doctors that say the opposite. It's not just him, right? He's a stand-in for, you know, thousands of epidemiologists. Like, is it possible that you guys, all you know, for all your best intentions, like, that you guys aren't properly evaluating scientific studies? Because you're not doctors. No, I- I'm not a doctor. I've taken ivermectin. I know it works. I don't need a doctor to tell me it works. I know it works. I've seen other people take it who were sick, really sick, take it, and it works. So if 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 he has the stance that it's still a placebo, mm-hmm. then he's an idiot, and he's part of what's wrong with what's going on here. Also, Zoe, yeah. I want to add that I've never once said that I was the reviewer of all these clinical studies. Mm-hmm. Um, these studies that have come out, I've personally spoken with doctors who've been evaluating the studies, mm-hmm. and that's where I'm getting my answers from. The two sides on this are so divided and both so embattled that the one thing they have in common is how misunderstood each side feels by the other. At that board meeting at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, it was true for Dr. Gordillo, it was true for Tanya. I don't think you'd understand unless you were on this side of the opinion gateway, Mm -hmm. how shitty they made us feel. Because of what? Like, to me, it's like, why am I, I just don't, I, I don't believe in mandates. It doesn't mean that I'm a fascist. It doesn't mean- Tanya that was like, I, okay, it's I not going to work at Sarasota Memorial. Work. The hospital would never surrender. The hospital was not going to change. No. They were never even going to offer an apology. So I, I knew that there was, there, we needed a place where people could go and be seen by a doctor regardless. So let's say another pandemic happens. Are you still, are you comfortable going to see your doctor today? No. Will you be in two years if another pandemic happens? No. So we still need a place. And that was the whole point with Vic was I just more so than anything told him we've got to get something. We have to get something up. We have to. After that meeting. Yeah. That's when the medical center at 959 East Venice Avenue became a reality. Florida is a great place to do this. Tanya's side is winning in Florida. In September 2021, DeSantis hired this vaccine skeptical surgeon general to run Florida's response to the COVID pandemic. Someone who altered a report's findings to claim the COVID vaccine had more adverse side effects than it actually has. DeSantis started publicly questioning the vaccines, saying they could be dangerous, and publicly deriding CDC protocols. This anti-vaccine agenda in Florida arguably had consequences. One study estimated 30,000 extra deaths just in Florida because people didn't get vaccinated. DeSantis also created this brand new committee of physicians who would assess any federal health guidelines coming into the state. Dr. Gordillo at Sarasota Memorial Hospital calls this group radical, extremely right wing, outside of mainstream science. The same day he announced that committee, DeSantis filed a petition with the Florida Supreme Court to convene a grand jury, a grand jury to look into things Pfizer and Moderna claimed about the vaccine, which he says were criminally misleading. Dr. Gordillo was like, what is happening? You know, it's just to the whole thing to me is just so politicized. And and that upsets me because, you know, to see that coming from uh our governor, that's a little bit too much for me. Yeah, what do you mean too much for you? Yeah, I can take it. I, 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 it's just, um, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that I never saw that it was going to happen in the United States. You know, I maybe if we, I live in North Korea, perhaps, hmm. you know, or in China, but not in the U.S. 
In what sense? In the sense that we're we're telling people we're, we're getting a radical view uh, and do not accept any other uh, uh, any other points of view, mm-hmm. and then push the agenda. DeSantis is now campaigning for president on his COVID policies, the way he quote unquote fought back the Iron Curtain of Fauciism. The language he uses seems designed to appeal to anyone who believes that COVID was a virus created to control us all. From the very beginning, we refused to let this state descend into some type of Faucian dystopia. This is him at CPAC a year ago. In Florida, we reject the biomedical security state, which erodes liberty, harms livelihoods, and divides our society. We've stood for freedom across the board, and the result has been Florida has defeated Fauciism. Freedom has prevailed in the Sunshine State. Governor DeSantis just signed a set of four medical freedom bills into law two months ago. The press release reads, Permanent Protections for Floridians from the Biomedical Security State. It not only outlaws any, quote, discrimination based on vaccine status, it also protects a doctor's right to disagree with what DeSantis has called the preferred narrative of the medical community. The legislation protects doctors from any discipline by state medical boards for spreading wrong information about, say, ivermectin or the vaccine. That's good news for Vic's clinic and any doctors or nurses who choose to work there. DeSantis wants them to keep practicing here in Florida. There have been a bunch of other medical freedom-type bills introduced in state legislatures around the country in the past year. And you can see some Republican legislators citing what's happening in Florida as their inspiration. Some of these bills protect doctors who want to promote things like ivermectin for COVID. Florida's law is far and away the most comprehensive. It's the only one that prohibits, quote, international health organizations, the ones Vic and Tanya are so worried about, from dictating state policy, for example. Florida stands alone. As Vic prepares for his clinic's opening in September, he's part of a growing market for anti-vax enthusiasts. The medical freedom movement already has blood banks for the unvaccinated, a whole suite of unvaccinated fertility options, unvaccinated sperm, unvaccinated surrogacy, unvaccinated eggs, unvaccinated breast milk donation, unvaccinated dating dating apps are a thing. Mike Flynn recently soft launched an unvaccinated online community called For the Pure. And Vic, he's already planning an outpatient surgery center next to 959 East Venice. And he says words getting out about the clinic. My phone is blowing up with people that want to build with the same concept. So, um, what do you mean, say more about that? Expansion. Yeah, this this is already, and and I only got so much time in my day to do certain things that I'm already doing. So, um, probably in August, I'm I'm going to really entertain. Um, expanding into clinics up and down the west coast of Florida. So, oh, absolutely. But like, this one won't, isn't even open yet. Yeah, but it will be. It's going to It's yeah. going to be successful. When Tanya showed me around the clinic, she pointed to the very front wall. To explain what she wants to put there, she tells me that when she staffed the clinic, she reached out to some of the doctors who'd lost their jobs for what she saw as telling the truth, going against the mainstream. Like the pediatrician she hired, Dr. Renata Moon. She'd been terminated from her practice in Spokane, Washington, she says, for refusing to turn over paperwork showing she was vaccinated against COVID. I really want to take the doctor's letters of termination and frame them and put them all along this wall. Because I have probably about 20 or 30 of them that would send them to me. It speaks volumes when you can see, sorry, we're terminating you because you refused to stop treating with ivermectin. Well, That's I, like really showing like what this place is yeah. about. It's about freedom. It's, it has, it's not ivermectin. It's the point of the doctors should be able to prescribe whatever 
they feel the patient could benefit from. What she's describing is the world DeSantis wants. And Tanya and Vic, they're just living in it, thriving in it. DeSantis wants this for all of America. He's out there selling it. Little problem he's having, though. Vic, anyway, he'd never go for DeSantis for president. He's a Trump guy. Terry Chase is the producer on our show. Coming up, you finally figure out what your dream job is, and it more or less gets outlawed by the Florida legislature. That's in a minute from Chicago Public Radio when our program continues. This American Life from Ira Glass. Today's show, The Florida Experiment. Ron DeSantis wants to make America more like Florida. We go for a visit to see what that might be like. We have arrived at Act Two of our program, Act Two. Their eyes were watching Tallahassee. So probably the biggest part of Governor DeSantis' agenda focuses on education. He and Florida Republicans have passed law after law defining what can and cannot be taught in the classroom. And that's not just in elementary and high schools. It's also in universities. This February, Florida Republicans in the State House introduced this big bill, HB 999, to limit what you can teach in every public college and university in the state. The earliest versions of the bill were far-reaching. They didn't just ban critical race theory and identity politics from all general education courses. They made it so no student could major or minor in gender studies or in what the bill calls radical feminist theory, things that have been standard in universities for decades. For professors who might try to sneak something by, early drafts of the bill didn't explicitly say what would happen to them, but they did say that tenured professors could have their tenure reviewed at any time. Understandably, professors all over the state wondered what this new bill was going to mean in practice. Manuel Jochi wondered that too, and followed things for one semester between the introduction of the bill and its final passage at one of the biggest universities in Florida, Florida State. He has this story about what it was like for a professor and one of her students. So one of the many students affected by this new law is Kaysen. She's black, moved to Florida as a kid. She was a freshman this past year. Kaysen's very bright, and not just in the smart and intelligent kind of way. She's a really positive person, very earnest. At a school with more than 30,000 undergrads, she couldn't meet enough of them. I will start talking to people if we just happen to be passing each other and I notice something. I'm like, oh my gosh, your hair looks so cute. Wow, you're a compliment queen. <laughs> yes, that would probably be a good way to put it. I meet a lot of people that way. Kaysen was also super passionate about the academic side of things. She chose Florida State in part because she got a scholarship and she was aiming to be the first person in her family to get a bachelor's degree. Her focus was to do something that would get her a job. So she looked into picking up a major in entrepreneurship, which would give her the tools to start her own business. But then she signed up for this African-American studies class, just, you know, to try it, which, as any disappointed parent of a business major who drops it all for a life in humanities can tell you, is how it starts. Kaysen loved the course, couldn't ask enough questions of a professor. I lost my mind. I entered a fervor um, because I knew I could not ask him every single question I wanted to in the middle of class. I would literally write down every single one of my thoughts. And then after class, I would literally follow him out of the building. We would just talk for like as he's walking to his car from the classroom. <laughs> and, but this man is trying to leave and you're just like, could you? Yes. Yeah. I would just be talking to him and asking him more and more questions when he thought about different things. Kaysen loved the class so much that by the end of the semester, she switched her major to English and added a minor in African-American studies. She wanted to dive deeper on black writers from her state, from Florida. So for her second semester, she signed up for a class on Southern black literature, the literatures and cultures of the Afro-Gulf South, taught by a black female professor named Dr. Alicia Gaines. And when Kaysen met Dr. Gaines on the first day of class, she was obsessed with her. I thought she was so cool. Um, she just kind of arrived into class with this kind of warm confidence. I remember noticing that she was wearing, like, what I would say is kind of like a fan, almost a fancy black dress, but then was wearing sneakers with it. The sneakers got you? I don't know. 
it was my first time having um like a black professor in college or like a black female professor in college and it was just it was like I was able to look at her and think to myself like I could be like that someday like that's something I could be Within a few weeks of meeting Dr. Gaines, Kaysen decided she was going to become just like her, become a professor of African-American literature. But right as she'd figured out what she wanted to do with her life, HB 999 was introduced. It was late February, a few weeks into the semester. I think that I first saw it on Instagram and I read over it and I thought to myself, well, that can't be true. That's insane. Kaysen realized that a lot of the things that she loved most about Gaines' class might be affected by this bill. The class was, of course, about literature, but it also involved discussions about the cultural and political context for each book. For example, at one point they read a novel about one family's experience of Hurricane Katrina, and they talked about the role systemic racism played in the government's response to it. It felt like, without those sorts of discussions, literatures and cultures of the Afro-Gulf South just wasn't literatures and cultures of the Afro-Gulf South. And she felt like her entire field of study, Black literature, specifically Black literature that probed the true legacy of what it means to be Black in America, the thing she had just realised she wanted to make her life's work, was under threat. Like, there was one day where they were discussing Their Eyes Are Watching God in class, and Kaysen just couldn't stop thinking about the bill. I was just thinking about... What if no one else ever gets to even read this in a class again? What if no one gets to have these kind of discussions that we're having again? Kaysen wondered how seriously she should take the bill. It was something I was wondering about too. I thought, this bill's just a draft. Surely a lot of this sweeping language targeting subjects, that was going to come out right? And even if it didn't, and the bill passed, it's such an attack on free speech, surely it wouldn't hold up in court. But pretty much every one of the professors who talked to me at FSU said that the bill's very introduction had a chilling effect. The language in the bill was so broad, it was hard to pin down exactly what would be prohibited. Professors told me that they and their colleagues were feeling pressure to change things about their work, regardless of what happened with the law. And Dr. Gaines says that didn't seem like an accident. Some of the early versions of this legislation is so ridiculous and outlandish. And you realize it's written to chill. It's written to put us on notice. But even believing that, it was hard to know what to do. Like, the same week the bill was introduced, Dr. Gaines got word that she was going to be teaching a course she hadn't taught before in the fall. Major figures in American literature which is a really broad subject, right? Like, in theory, you could teach any assortment of great American authors. And Dr. Gaines was considering making the focus of the class the authors of the Harlem Renaissance. The authors that I would want to talk with students about are major American authors, but they're also black. Um, So can I just teach... ...being passed around. And on it were 34 classes at FSU. Most of the professors I talked to about it didn't know exactly what it meant to be on the list, but they figured it wasn't a good thing. At first, it wasn't exactly clear who created the list. The DeSantis administration? The university? So the first class on the list is... Dr. Gaines and I look through the list. There are programs and classes you'd expect to see. Okay. Courses that talk about race and gender and ways that might concern Republicans on an anti-woke crusade, like AMH 2096... Black Women in America, or SYD 3800, Sociology of Sex and Gender. But there are many classes missing. Dr. Gaines's class that Kaysen was in, Literatures and Cultures of the Afro-Gulf South, wasn't on there. Right. Which made no sense. Not that she was complaining. That, um, excuse me, uh, legislatures, that is an exhaustive list of all the courses that you need to worry about. Thank you. Um, complete list. Don't look any further. <laughs> You also had a lot of classes that didn't seem to fit. Like classical perspectives on dance, masterpieces of German literature. After looking into it, I figured out that the university made the list. 
but the Standards Administration had requested all public universities send in a comprehensive list of anything on campus related to diversity and inclusion and critical race theory. I couldn't get anyone at the school to explain to me why this oddly random list of courses was what they decided to send in. Was it some Machiavellian mind game? Was it incompetence? Who knows? But this disembodied list being passed around? It had an effect. It added to the web of self-doubt and fear that professors at FSU were feeling. Some of them were already changing their courses, trying to make them hold up to scrutiny. I talked to one professor who removed work by Ibram Kendi from his syllabus and emphasised empirical studies about traffic stops and hiring discrimination instead. Two other professors took the understandable step of changing the names of their courses, basically erasing the giant targets they had on their backs. A class called Critical Race Theory will now be listed as the Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. Another class, Feminism and Travel, you can find that under the new name, Journeys in Women's Literature. Both courses are, content-wise, basically the same as they were before. We are already self-censoring. And in fact, I pulled critical race theory out of my self-description on my faculty webpage. That's Dr. Celia Caputi, one of Dr. Gaines's colleagues in the English department. She teaches classes about women's literature, and the subjects targeted in the legislation were so open to interpretation, with no explanation of what the punishment would be, that she honestly couldn't figure out what she should be teaching. Feminist theory and gender studies were baked into her courses. She worried about losing her tenure and getting fired. And so she spent an enormous amount of time this past semester trying to do whatever she could to protect herself. I had started writing a new article just about a week ago. And now I look at the first page and I was really proud. I wrote down, I wrote the introduction up. I had written a lot of notes, but I finally sat down at the computer and wrote up the introduction. And well, guess what? It references um, a concept called the lesbian continuum in the second paragraph. (laughs) (laughs) What's the lesbian continuum? Okay, the lesbian continuum is a concept here. We're talking feminist theory. Uh Uh-oh, you know, the F word, a terrible thing. The lesbian continuum is a a concept put forth by um, lesbian feminist poet Adrian Rich. And her theory is that in a patriarchal heterosexist culture where women are fully responsible for caring for infants, every child, every infant's first love is his or her mother. And so that for women, the initial disposition is same-sex love. And that heterosexist culture forces a woman to realign herself. And you know, for In other words, book, if you're a Florida Republican who believes that radical liberal professors are turning students gay, this article would be a red flag. You see now how this puts me in this yeah. situation? <laughs> I see now how you're in it, yeah. Yeah, every, everything I want to do, everything I can get excited about, makes me feel... Um, insecure at this at the same time it's uh, is this gonna make me or break me the chilling effect is a is a lie this is one of the people who wrote hb 999 state representative alex andrade he'd been hearing about this chilling effect from so many critics of the bill he was defensive when i asked about it at first about his intent very angry that people thought he and the bill were racist, which he denies. He says the fear that greeted HB 999 was inflamed by Democrats and the media. When I said that professors were feeling like they needed to change their courses, he was like, good, maybe they need to. The whole purpose of the bill is to, if you're going to make an argument, tie it to fact, tie it to evidence, and if you want to still teach a conclusion without evidence... Higher education institutions in the state of Florida may not be for you. Here's the thing. Andrade doesn't believe that systemic racism is inherent to the institutions of the United States today, even though a whole host of academic work says it is. He says it's important that people learn about the systemic racism of the past. Learn about Jim Crow, for example. But that's the past, he says. If there's an institution that's racist right now, he said to me, I'll fight it with you. Tell me, tell me what institution is racist. Our justice system, like, it is inherently unequal and does disproportionately affect black men. 
And there is a direct line between like high rates of incarceration and policing that is tied to possible implicit racial bias. I think that's pretty that's pretty cut and dry. Well, no, there, there's no question. There's no question that there have been, been instances. What I've just told you is that if you point me to an institution that is intentionally being racist today, I will fight it with you. OK, that, that's great. I hope you're noticing the distinction Andrade is making here. He's saying there are isolated instances of, say, black men being arrested because they're black. But that's not proof of institutional racism. There's no evidence. If you can't point to me what what institution is racist today. Yeah, I, I mean, I have. But let's, let's move on here because I have other questions and I want to be aware Whoa, of your Emmanuel, time. Emmanuel, I have. Emmanuel. Come on, mate. Like, no, you haven't. I don't know. I would disagree with that. And like... A big part of teaching also is just acknowledging where the weight of the scholarship is. And if the weight of the scholarship, which it does, says that, you know, like a lot of our systems in this country, like, are inherently unequal because initially they were not necessarily built to serve everybody. Um, I, I, there's that, that just kind of is what it is. The, no, the, the, there's no, there's no disagreement that Jim Crow laws were racist, you know, that are, are, are evidence of systemic racism. Mm-hmm. However, if anyone is saying today, current our institutions are inherently racist. Yeah, that's where you would disagree. Because it's just it's just false. <laughs> right. Well, we're disagreeing. I don't think it's false. I, I know it's not. But um, no, but thank you for sharing that. He did this a few times. Presented with the weight of the evidence, he'd just say, there's no evidence. Or he'd mention a study that he'd seen. And this is what's making life for professors so hard. They do already present clear and fact-based evidence. But Andrade is telling them they can't state what that evidence adds up to if it's a conclusion he and the Republican legislature don't agree with. How do you navigate that? As one professor told me, we can't just get up there and be like, so... There's these discrepancies in health outcomes. But, you know, I can't tell you why. That's just not teaching. I reached out to the Sanders administration to ask them about HB 999. They didn't directly respond to my questions. Instead, their press secretary sent me links to a DeSantis press conference and a couple of other public statements about the bill. And the message from those was pretty clear. If you want to teach stuff about critical race theory or gender ideology, we're not going to be funding it. Go somewhere else. Dr. Gaines said that professors heard that message loud and clear. Students did too. Kaysen? For sure. She was following the news about the bill. She came up and approached me at the end of my class, and she was just very upset. She said, what are you going to do about it? What did she mean by that? I think she meant, are you going to curtail what you have to say or what we're going to read or teach? Are you going to roll over? Kason said she actually meant something a little different. I wanted to know how she was handling it because I kind of wanted to know how I should handle it almost. Oh, you were like, I need to ask her how she's handling it so I can know how seriously I should be taking this. Like, how afraid I should be. Yeah. Dr. Gaines told Kaysen she wasn't going to change her class at all. But she'd been feeling the pressure. A few weeks earlier, she decided to show a documentary in both of the classes she was teaching that semester. The documentary was called Invisible History, Middle Florida's Hidden Roots. And it was a documentary about the legacy of slavery around Leon County, where FSU was located. The first class she showed it to was all grad students. And when the film was finished, there was this stunned silence in the room. And one of my graduate students said, well, DeSantis didn't want us to see that. As in, Dr. Gaines, you just did something that could get you in trouble. Dr. Gaines was surprised, like, this was just a fact-based documentary that had been made by a filmmaker in residence at FSU. Though it is pretty unflinching in the way it ties Leon County's Jim Crow past with its present. Half an hour later, she screened the same documentary for Kaysen's class, and they were in the middle of the film when she noticed something. 
I think the documentary was about, uh, had gotten to a point about lynching. So it was a very heavy moment. I'm not going to say it wasn't. Yeah. Um, that history is hard, that's painful, and that history is right here in Leon County itself. And there is a moment where a student walked out of the classroom while it was screening. I literally kind of like jumped in my seat because I wasn't sure why he was leaving. Dr. Gaines started panicking. I was immediately thinking, is he walking out because he's protesting what I'm screening? Is he walking out because he's made so very uncomfortable by this documentary about um, slavery in Leon County or middle Florida? All these things are kind of racing through my head. And Gaines wasn't I, sure what would happen moment, if she had offended this kid. And in any so semester, she wrote down some notes about where exactly in the film he'd walked out of where and then sat there, the anxiously looking at the other students sure to see if anyone else was going to follow. Leaving. And then... That student came back a few minutes later. He had just gone to the restroom. And so I, I'm having this... <gasps> Oh, gosh. He was just using the restroom. I checked with a student, and he hadn't actually gone to the bathroom. He stepped into the hall because of some news he'd gotten. But Dr. Gaines was seeing threats where there weren't any. She was beginning to doubt herself. It's that double think that I have never had to do in a classroom in my entire career. By early April... As the bill was being debated in committee, Kaysen was finding it increasingly difficult to stay upbeat as she saw news about the bill's progress. It had been a rough semester. I was trying my best to enjoy it, even though there was a kind of constant backdrop of stress with everything happening. And I thought about dropping out of college. Wait. <laughs> Maybe I, yeah. It ran through my head several times, even though I enjoyed it, even though I was so focused on getting to class. In my head, several times, I was like, maybe I should just bail out. It, it's kind of like if someone gives you a, like a beautiful present, like they give you a beautiful watch. And they say like, hey, I might take this away at any second. And when I take it away, I'm just straight up going to mud. Do politics. All that systemic racism or sexism are built into the institutions of the United States. Kaysen saw the news about the bill passing and thought about her future. They're not going to stop here, she told me. Of leaving. You stay and you try to make things right. And if you do leave, it's because you found something that you definitely know is better. You leave for you, not for them. Whether or not Kaysen stays in Florida through grad school, the one thing she knows for sure is that she still wants to be a professor, just like Dr. Gaines. The new law didn't change that. It did have a chilling effect. But what that looks like right now, among the professors I talk to, is people feeling fear. Maybe changing their course names or removing things from their CVs. But mostly, these educators are standing their ground and teaching the same things they were before. Dr. Gaines, for instance, that class about major American writers, she decided to go ahead and teach only black authors from the Harlem Renaissance. Dr. Celia Caputi is moving ahead of her article referencing the lesbian continuum. The faculty union's telling everyone, don't change your classes. If they try to use the law to stop you, we'll fight. Reporter Emmanuel Jochi. Act three, goodbye sunshine. So here's here's my bedroom. Mm -hmm. Like my suitcase is is out on my bed, and then I just have three boxes left to unpack. Actually, no, two boxes left to unpack. So we started our show with people moving to Florida. We end with somebody moving away. But the floor is just Eliza's sixteen, just finished her sophomore year of high school. And I talked to her two days after she arrived in the house her family just moved to in Virginia. They moved because of the law that Ron DeSantis enacted in May that bans gender affirming care. For anybody under 18, Eliza's trans, takes a hormone blocker, an estrogen. Yeah, it was just kind of a concern is that I wouldn't be able to, you know, get the care that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we had to we had to move somewhere where we knew that that wouldn't be threatened at least for another couple of years. Eliza's dad is in the military, so she's moved around a lot. Ohio, Texas, Germany, Los Angeles, Huntsville, Montgomery. Been to lots of schools. She says usually there's an even split between people who believe different kinds of things. But not in her school in Florida. It was just very, I feel like the entire scale was was shifted to the right. I feel like even the most like progressive people at my school were still way, way less progressive than any other place that I've that I've been in before. Um, it's just so, so casual, just really common, um, really normal, you know, to just be like awful and then to be exclusionary to people. Um, but I, I, I just got kind of used to it. It, I don't know, Florida's just going to be Florida. You know, we're putting this interview with you, our conversation that we're having right now, into an episode of our show that begins with people who moved to Florida because they like the politics there. And I wonder, like, like when you hear that, like, what do you think of people like that? Um, I think that is that is a, a crazy thing to hear, and it just kind of shows. I don't know. I feel like, like, congratulations. You know that the the things that are being threatened every day don't affect you. You're you're lucky. Um, but that's not the case for me, and that's not the case for a lot of people. Parts of the law that made Eliza move have been overturned by the courts, but that doesn't matter to her family. Eliza wasn't out to many people in Florida. Most kids at school didn't know she was trans. So when she had to explain to them the reason why she was leaving, 